Life on Earth has been nearly annihilated five major times. Previously, we discussed the first of Earth's big five mass extinctions, the Ordovician. Never in Earth's history had there been a series of events so devastating so as to suck up entire oceans and leave 85% of life on Earth essentially high and dry. But the Devonian extinction would give the big freeze of the Ordovician a run for its money just 60 million years later, with the potential primary culprit being from one of the most unlikely sources, land plants. The oddball Ordovician was certainly stacked with strangeness, but the Devonian would host its own crazy cast of unique creatures that would make your lizard brain tremble with a primal fright. Known as the Age of the Fishes, the Devonians sported some absolutely fantastic specimens. Many of these organisms emerged in a period of time known as the Silurian. This would be seated between the Ordovician and the Devonian. And it is in the Silurian that we see the emergence of one of the most enigmatic of these groups, the Placoderms. The name Placoderm means plate-skinned, and these animals lived up to that name. The placoderm orders were as unique and weird as one may expect from evolution's first attempt at making a fish that didn't look like a chunky brainlet tadpole or an actual vacuum cleaner. Wait. Hold on. Say that to my face, you stupid mother. That being said, placoderms were not immune to some errors in aesthetic. Let's meet some contestants for the Devonian's next top placoderm. Antiarchy, the substrate scourge who Wikipedia charitably describes as, quote, heavily armored to the point that it literally resembles a box with eyes, unquote. Later forms had super-derived fins equipped with elbow joints, and its name means opposite anus thanks to a mishap in fossil identification. Brindispelospida, a long-snouted and quite basal placoderm with a cool dorsal fin. Philo lapida, a flat lad similar to modern burrowing ambush fish, with eyes so small they might have been vestigial. Renanida, a ray analog with enormous pectoral fins. Phycodontia, the sexually dimorphic placoderm with reduced plating. Acanthothoraci, the spiny chested chimera analog with a bony tooth plate and a bone to pick with the phycodonts. Pedalichthyida, a small and oddly shaped placoderm brought to you by the lowercase t. And finally, the supremely diverse winner of Devonian's next top placoderm, the Arthrodirans. With an enormous radiation that includes everyone's favorite marine horror, the Douglasteus, most members of this order lacked teeth, instead opting for the use of sharpened bony plates. These plates were essentially giant guillotines in the ancient seas, which is why 20-foot-long Douglasteus is considered one of the world's first super predators, and it's also thought to have given birth to live young. This guy's actually cool enough to have its own action figure. <laughs> Check out this sweet, articulated jaw. Take this baby with me everywhere I go and um, tell anyone who will listen about how cool Devonian fauna are. It's actually also quite heavy um, and would make a nice like eyeball jabber if someone tried to mug me on my way to my car. Um, obviously they would be mugging me too to take this, my, my prized possession. <laughs> But the pervasive placoderms weren't the only ones taking advantage of the wide open spaces. The Devonian is known also for being a heyday for ancient reefs, which stretched for upwards of 3 million miles. This is over 10 times the size of, of the surface area that, that modern reefs cover. Between the enormous reefs and the monstrous placoderms, there was a group of underdogs laying low. The Sarcopterygians, or lobe-finned fish, whose descendants had a date with land. Being a smaller lobe-finned fish would not have been easy at this time. Neil Shubin, the founder of Tiktaalik, can be quoted as having this to say. The strategies to success in the Devonian were pretty obvious. 
get big and get armor, or get out of the water. It looks as if our distant ancestors avoided the fight. There is another reason, though, as to why organisms like Eusthenopteron may have dwelled along the coastlines and Tiktaalik may have made pilgrimages to this green new world. There were arthropods. The movement onto land rewarded those brave enough, and this would have been many of those early tetrapods, with delectable insect hors d'oeuvres, or should I say, uh, proto-insect hors d'oeuvres. Proto-insects who had been drawn to the land themselves by brand new plant life. But both the water-to-land transition for the tetrapods and, of course, the similar transition for the arthropods, both of these deserve their own video, as they're fascinating stories in their own right. Back in the Ordovician, plants began their trek onto the vast and barren landmasses whose interiors looked more Martian than anything else. This period was known for the itty-bitty liverworts that bravely made the leap from water to land, and was known as the Lilliputan plant world. Plants wouldn't be found outside these knee-high pocket groves along tidal areas. But somewhere during the mid-Devonian, plants would absolutely explode in size, stretching inland at a dizzying rate. Proto-trees emerged, growing up to 30 feet tall and utilizing a brand new phenomenon, powerful root systems. These roots drove into the earth below, properly anchoring themselves and setting the stage for soil. But the origin of the forests would spell doom for the placoderms. Dead zones today are wholly well understood. Essentially, nutrients wash into rivers and streams, typically from human agricultural settlements, and they end up in the seas. Once there, a process known as eutrophication begins, which is essentially this massive influx of nutrients into the water, which of course feeds the algae, and you get these massive algae blooms. Now these blooms survive and thrive, and then of course they die. And as they decompose, which is a relatively quick process, they suck oxygen from the surrounding waters and suffocate all of the fish and, and other sea life that tend to be unfortunately in that area. The modern Gulf of Mexico experiences this each and every year. In the Devonian, new forests broke down rocks with their root systems, kicking nutrients such as phosphorus loose and washing them into rivers and oceans. Plankton utilized these new food supplies and bloomed en masse, choking out many of the fish. This can be seen geologically by a somewhat sudden appearance of black shale, corresponding with the forests gaining ground. Things got worse with the evolution of Archaeopteris, not to be confused with Archaeopteryx, who we will meet later. Archaeopteris was a 100-foot-tall cedar-like tree, with bark and a deep root system that no plant had seen before. Soil was churned and nutrients were dumped, catalogued by massive carbon burials around this period. But to make matters worse, narrow seas allowed these blooms to concentrate rather than disperse out, killing even more, even faster. Anoxia was rampant. But the plants weren't done. Perhaps those deep sea placoderms could have held out against this massive eutrophication event. But those new forests had an additional trick up their sleeve. Slurping up inordinate amounts of CO2 from the surrounding air and general atmosphere. If we remember from the carbon disaster that occurred in the Ordovician, terrible things happen when you throw a wrench into the carbon silicate cycle. Trees sapped CO2 from the air, reducing the atmosphere by up to 90% according to some studies, and another solid portion was sequestered into the soil. This caused the temperature to plummet. The first extinction pulse is known as the Kelwasser event, and while much of it is still up for debate, the role of plants is thought to be heavily involved. Some have argued that after the plants did their damage, a massive volcanism event caused a global warming, but this appears to be the less supported idea. The second major pulse, known as the Hangenberg event, is thought to be the horrific close to the Devonian period, taking with it all of the powerful placoderms. The Hangenberg event is characterized by cold and ice. While the southern hemisphere was undergoing glaciation event, pulling even more CO2 from the waters, the plants were still diversifying and contributing to blooms, both of which spurred the sea levels to drop. Large animals simply couldn't survive in these anoxic seas. 
The entire Devonian extinction takes place over the course of 20 to 25 million years. And while extinction skyrockets actually being considered one of the worst extinction events of all time for vertebrates, there was an additional problem. Life simply couldn't keep up. Typically, irradiation after an extinction event allows for loads of new organisms, but for whatever reason, it took longer for life to regain its biodiversity after the Devonian. Everything just looked relatively uniform. Tetrapods barely survived as well, their fossil record presence becoming rare as the Carboniferous begins. But what is equally as strange is their form. Prior to extinction, tetrapods had digit ranges of 5 to 8, but for some reason, only five-digited tetrapods survived the blow, which is why all living tetrapods today share this formula. What's more, a new group seized the seas in the massive shadow of skeleton reefs, the crinoids. I'm going to read a passage from my primary source for this series now, as it transports you to this barren new world. Some 359 million years ago, the tepid seas are gone, dry land is underfoot, and huge river canyons cut through the frigid wastes. A few miles further south, rafts of ice float just offshore in the shrunken anoxic seas. The distant Appalachian Titans now spill out glaciers from their rugged gates, and still further south, on the southern supercontinent, are howling expanses of white. Underneath the glacial stillness are the remains of the placoderms, every last one of them dead after a 70 million year stewardship of the Earth's oceans. Also gone are those great forests of Archaeopteris, perhaps doomed by their own success. The greatest reefs in the world are long since dead, broken and buried. Close inspection of the seawater reveals that even the plankton is a shade of its former miniature splendor, while squid-like animals that bobbed under the surf in coiled shells have all but disappeared. On land, a harsh wind blows through the surviving shrubs, the architects of all this devastation, as well as the authors of all flourishing life on land to come. With atmospheric carbon bottoming out, we are at the opening salvo of the longest ice age in the history of animal life, the 100 million year late Paleozoic Ice Age. But as the organisms left from the Devonian recovered, life, as it tends to, began anew. Tetrapods are back and flourishing in the mid-Carboniferous, laying eggs and getting big. Insects are larger and the seas are beginning to teem again. The Carboniferous is a humid and junglish playground for life to experiment in. And in the Permian that follows, animals begin doing weird things, and synapsids come to dominate the Earth. But just as life recovers and adapts, troubles roil on the horizon. Churning in the deep seas and humming in the mantle of the Earth looms the next and worst disaster ever faced by planet Earth. The Permian mass extinction, which would claim 96% of all life, loomed over a new menagerie of organisms. It was patient, it was devastating, and it was inevitable.